Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here, talking about Amos chapter 5, particularly verse 21, and why our Father hates our feast days. Now, we hear people talk about this all the time, especially people who don't want to keep his feast days and actually want to justify keeping the pagan holidays instead. They'll point to this verse saying that he despises our feast days as if he's saying that he doesn't want us to do it. Now, I've covered in other classes how he doesn't say that he despises his feast days, but that he despises our feast days or your feast days, implying that there's something wrong with our feast days. But I wanted to make this video because, like I said, people are taking this even further and saying stuff like that. Our father rejects our offerings and our praises now. That's, that's not what he meant at all. So in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to look at specific verses on why it is that our father hates our feast days. By the end of this video, Father willing, you should understand what it is that you have to do in order to prepare yourself so that your feast days are accepted. The first verse that we're going to look at is over here in Amos in chapter 5. Now, it is verse 21 that talks about how he despises our feast days, but I want to bring your attention back up to verse 20, which is talking about the day of the Lord, which is implying that it is during this time when we're in judgment day that he's actually going to despise our feast days. And that would be the worst time. That's when we need the feast days the most when we are in trouble. So I think it's important for us to get this right. Anyway, verse 20 says, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Yeah, this is what we are expecting when they talk about a famine. It's not necessarily going to be a famine of food. However, some people will suffer hunger in these days. But what he's talking about when we hear about the famine in the end times is he's talking about a famine on the word of our father. Those that are speaking truth will become scarce in the last days, while those who are teaching the doctrine of devils or the gospel of liberty will dominate in the last days, just like they are today. And then in the next verse, he says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell your solemn assemblies. So here is the crux of the problem here is that he's saying that he despises your feast days. But again, notice that he doesn't say his feast days. In Leviticus chapter 23, he says, these are the feasts of the Lord. He doesn't say they are your feasts or that they are our feasts. He says that they are his feast days. And we know that our father never changes. So there's no way that he's going to stop enjoying his feast days. It is ours that he despises because there's something that we are doing wrong. And we're going to see that here. But before we do, let's look at verse 22 that says, Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. And this is important, guys. We do peace offerings all the time. Anytime you have a barbecue and you invite people over, you're actually doing a peace offering. Now, if you're not following the biblical rules that pertain to that peace offering, they're not going to be accepted anyway. But even when you do make the peace offering correctly, he's not going to accept them. So let's get into why. Now, I have to give our father all praise and honor for this understanding. I was reading over in Haggai in chapter two, when this verse jumped out at me, verse 12 says, if one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, no. So like I said, now this is the verse that our father used to help me understand why our feast days and our offerings are being rejected. So you see right there, he's asking the question, if you take a holy thing, if you take holy flesh, if you take the offering and you put it in a garment and then you use that garment to touch something else, does that garment make everything else around it clean? And the priest said no. So in other words, if you are to take the meat from the sacrifice, which is a holy thing and eat it, 
Does that make anything you touch clean? And the answer, of course, is no. But then look at verse 13. He says, Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. So you have the clean thing. You have the offering or anything clean for that matter. The Bible gives specifics on cleanliness and the rules associated with cleanliness. And one of the things we find out is if we are unclean or if something unclean touches that which is clean, it makes that thing unclean. And so that's why the priest answered and said, yes, it will be unclean. Even though it started off as being a clean thing, it's now being touched by somebody who touched a dead body. Now look at verse 14. It says, then answered Haggai and said, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. So here is the problem, guys. We are touching clean things. This is why he despises our offerings. This is why he despises our feast days. We're actually going into these feast days like Passover, where we are sacrificing a lamb on the altar. But we're doing it with unclean hands. And so we are making his offering unclean. This is stated plainly over in Leviticus chapter 7. Let me just read verse 19. It says, And the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burnt with fire. And as for the flesh, all that be clean shall eat thereof. So we have this offering here, but we have people who are unclean, particularly ourselves, that are touching this clean offering. We're doing so with unclean hands, making that offering unclean, thereby it cannot be accepted. Look at verse 20. It says, But the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord, having his uncleanliness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. So you see right here, it almost seems like he's doing us a favor by not accepting our offerings. If he were accepting our offerings, but yet we're touching them with unclean hands or eating them with our uncleanliness upon us, then we would be cut off. So think about that for a second. Here we are new to the faith and we are going into a feast. So we're trying to do the right thing according to the scripture as our Messiah commanded us to do. But since we are unclean, we're actually getting cut off. And the way I understand being cut off, that kind of makes us a backslider or even turns us back into a heathen as we are separated from his people. Verse 21 says, Moreover, the soul that shall touch any unclean thing as the uncleanliness of man or any unclean beast or any abominable unclean thing and eat the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which pertain unto the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So he said it twice, which means that he's very serious about this. Us touching the offerings, us partaken in these feast days could actually get us cut off altogether. And I believe, and you could tell me what you believe in the comment section, is by rejecting these feast days, rejecting our offerings actually either prevents us from being cut off or maybe by doing so we are getting ourselves cut off. But either way, it is wrong. We are doing wrong. We are harming ourselves by touching these offerings when we are unclean. But we're going to get into what we have to do about it here in a second. So don't worry. Just hold on for a minute. But before we go over there, let me bring you to Second Chronicles in chapter 30. This is when Hezekiah actually reinstituted the Passover. They had forgotten it all the many years that they weren't in touch with the law. And when King Hezekiah found out about the law, one of the first things he did was to have the people to actually partake in Passover. But you look in verse two and they couldn't partake in first Passover. They had to partake in second Passover. And verse three says the reason why is for they could not keep it 
at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. So the people weren't in Jerusalem, but even if they had been there, they couldn't have partaken in the Passover because the priests hadn't gone through the sanctification process. They would have been touching the offering with unclean hands. And then that feast of Hezekiah would have been rejected. And the whole story that we read about over in Chronicles would have been really, really different. So you see down there in verse 15, after the priests and the Levites had sanctified themselves, that they were then able to perform the offerings. Verse 17 says, for there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore, the Levites had charge of the killing of the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. Now, we're talking a lot about Passover, but I believe this actually pertains to all of the feasts, Pentecost, as well as the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall, where we are required to make these offerings. We are required to be sanctified here. And what's odd about this verse, you see here that it was the Levites who are sanctified that were responsible for killing the Passovers, which means that they would have been responsible for killing the Passover for everybody. While in the other scripture, we're told that you're supposed to kill your own Passover lamb. But because the people hadn't been sanctified, this was not possible. The priests had to do it for them. But now look down here in verse 18, it says, For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. So you see there, they're not even supposed to eat the Passover if they have not cleansed themselves. This is the common man we're talking about here. But it goes on to say, but Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. So now here, this is important here. First of all, we're understanding that they were not supposed to eat it because they weren't sanctified. And then it goes down in verse 19 to say they were supposed to be sanctified or purified according to the purification of the sanctuary. So what is this sanctification? What are they talking about? So we come over here to the book of Exodus, where we start to first hear about the sanctification process of the common people. Now, down here in verse 10, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. So here we start to hear about the sanctification process, which actually includes the washing of the clothes. And that shouldn't be too surprising because many of the uncleanliness laws requires a person to take a bath and to wash their clothes and they will become clean again at sunset. Now, just as an aside note, this is why people try to claim that the biblical laws are antiquated. This is at least one of the reasons, because now we take baths and we put on clean clothes every day. Unlike way back then when they didn't have running water or washing machines and they wore their same clothes for long periods of time. Well, we also have to remember after the day of the Lord, this will also be the case. Chances are we won't have running water or changes of clothes. So it is important that we know when it is necessary that we are to change our clothes and when we have to take a bath so that when the modern conveniences fail us, we'll still know how to stay clean. So it will be definitely necessary to be clean in the body as far as washing our clothes and taking baths. But is that all of the sanctification process? We will definitely do that before we partake in any offering. But when I did a search for the word sanctify in the Intellinial Bible, one of the first things that came up is Strong's number 37, which the definition of the word is to make holy, to consecrate or to sanctify. And then over in Leviticus, we find that the priests had to go through a seven day sanctification process over in Leviticus chapter eight. They actually had to hang out by the tabernacle for seven days in order to get consecrated. 
But this verse on sanctifying came from John chapter 17 and 17, which is in the New Testament. And then when I did a New Testament search for the word sanctify, Hebrews 13 and verse 12 came up. Verse 12 says, wherefore our Messiah also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffereth without the gate. So now here is the main point of this video is because we're learning here in verse 12 that we are sanctified through the blood of Christ, through the blood of our Messiah. So to me, this is how we do it in these times. Whenever I have a question like this, I'll often go to the Gospels to try to find out exactly what our Messiah did. Like, for instance, in this case, what did he do to sanctify himself, to prepare himself for the Passover? And we don't see anywhere where he hung out by the tabernacle for seven days. We don't even hear him talking about washing the clothes and taking baths or commanding the disciples to do so, even though we hear how he washed their feet. So if the scripture is going to go into that level of detail where we hear about our Messiah getting down and washing the feet of the disciples, why doesn't it mention him telling them that they had to take a whole bath and to wash their clothes? And I think verse 12 gives us the answer when he says, might sanctify the people with his own blood. See, back over there in Leviticus chapter 8, down in about verse 15, we find out that blood was necessary for purification and sanctification. We see in verse 23 where Moses actually took this blood and put it on the priests and sprinkled it all about. And you see at verse 30 that he put this blood on Aaron. He put it on the Levites, that would be his sons, and he even put it on the altar, the sanctuary, and everywhere did he splash this blood around as a sanctification. Well, that's what Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12 is talking about when it said that the Messiah sanctified the people with his own blood. And when we come over to Romans in chapter 3 and verse 25, we can start to get a hint on how exactly he did that. Let me just read it. It says, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So this is what our Messiah's blood is doing for us, is getting us the remission of our sins, which is actually purifying us. And then back there in Acts in chapter two, it's saying that we get remission of our sins through baptism. We learn in Luke chapter three that that's what John was doing when he was baptizing people, that baptism was of repentance for the remission of sins. But we ask the question, what did the Messiah do? He didn't get baptized a second time before he had the Passover. So where was the sanctification? How did our Messiah sanctify the disciples before they ate the Passover lamb on the 15th day of the first month? Well, we hear about what he did on the 14th day of the first month down there in Matthew chapter 26, where verse 27 says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Now, this is talking about the communion. But look at verse 28. It says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So, Guys, the way I'm understanding this is that we are actually supposed to do the communion festival before each one of these offerings. Before we make an offering, if we want that offering to be accepted before our Lord, we actually have to be purified. We have to be sanctified. And in order to do so, our Messiah gave us communion. This is how he actually died for our sins. When you ask people sometimes, how did the Messiah die for our sins? Those who teach the law of liberty will say that they crucified him on the cross and by doing so, the laws don't count anymore. And to me, that sounds like since we understand our Messiah as the word or the law made flesh, by them hanging him on the cross, they actually crucified the law. And since they killed the law that was made flesh, they don't have to worry about the law anymore. But Anyway, the way our Messiah really died for our sins is by what we see here, by instituting the Passover 
by giving us communion, by changing his blood into wine, we can now drink of this wine and get the remission of our sins. That's how he died for our sins. I say again, is that he changed his blood into wine that we partake on Passover. And the way I'm understanding here, we do so on the 50th day after first fruits, which is Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. That's what that day is all about. That falls on the 14th day of the third month, just like Passover falls on the 14th day of the first month. So that is the day that we get purified and sanctified before the holy day, which is the 15th day of the month, just like tabernacles is on the 15th day of the seventh month. So the way I'm understanding this is that we are supposed to do the communion before we start the offerings of tabernacles or any offering for that matter. So here we are looking at a schedule for the seventh month in the year 2022. And you see how we have tabernacles on the 15th day of the seventh month. I believe, and I say that again, I believe you, you can help me understand what you believe down in the comment section, but I believe we're supposed to do Passover sometime before tabernacles starts and me and my family plan on doing it at evening on the 14th day of the seventh month. Now, in the meantime, you could go watch a video we did about this back for the feast of the first month, talking about how we are to get sanctified before Passover. It goes into details about being baptized and the purpose of Passover. But tell me what you think. I realize there's some speculation in all of this, but one thing's for sure. We're going to have to be sanctified somehow, and it includes taking a bath and washing clothes, but I also believe that it includes being rebaptized if we haven't done so in a while and definitely keeping the communion before we make our offerings. Else our offerings will be rejected and we will be cut off. So very serious business. Tell me what you think down in the comment section and I'll see you down there. Go ahead and hit the like button. Make sure you subscribed so you can see future videos like this when they come out. And may our heavenly father, blessed be his name, bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.